my title's gone through many iterations, and finally I realized what I wanted to talk about after about four revisions. Ernest Hemingway, The Myth, The Man, because the more I have learned about Hemingway, and I read Hemingway a while ago when I was way back in graduate studies at Auburn, Alabama, um, the more I read, I realized that very quickly after he published The Sun Also Rises, his writing takes place very often in that tension between the myth and the man. You know, what, who is he, who does he think he's supposed to be, what does he have to live up to? So I'm looking today at Hemingway as a literary stylist. I'm talking about certain uh, facts from his family background that I think influenced how he wrote. Um, and then I want to conclude by looking at those last years and how difficult and unproductive they were for him. But end on a lighter note than that. Okay, it, you know so much about Hemingway. I'm sure you've seen this photo on the left, right? That's the one that gets reproduced all the time. Yusuf Karsh, who was one of the most well-known and well-respected uh, photo portraitist of the 20th century, made that in 1957. And that, you know, he just, the silver tones, it's wonderful. I didn't realize until I really got into it, did you know that Hemingway had this very big scar over his right eye? Because I did not, and I began to see photos of him with this livid scar, and I thought, was that always there? And that was there since 1927. He was with friends in France. They were drinking. Uh, he was in an unfamiliar hotel room. At 2 a.m., he went to the bathroom and pulled what he thought was the chain for the toilet, and it was the chain for the skylight. And so the whole thing came down, gave him a very nasty cut, um, and he was taken to, like, the Army Hospital for it to be sewn up, and they used nine whole stitches to close this thing. Now, but when he was younger, his editor, Max Perkins, said, we have to edit this out. You know, we have to airbrush this. This can't show up. And as he grew older, it really seemed like something that added a certain kind of, you know, bravado, um, increased his sense this, of being this man of action. And I, but this picture as well, you start to see him in his last years, it's just as Kasky mentioned. Um, after all of the concussions and the accidents and the diseases, and it took a toll on him. He was only 61 when he died, which is my age, which I think is very young. So, yeah, I can certainly tell you about that. Um, is there anything else? Oh, and I, yes, I wanted to tie my what I'm talking about into hunting and the Hemingway Code, because what I would wind up saying is what hunts, looking into what hunts Hemingway down at last. I mean, he's someone who pursues life, who pursues action, a strong, vital man. But once, what hunts him down at last? And I would also title my talk, Hemingway, a Shakespearean tragedy, because if you look at what he started out with and where he went with it and how things ended up. I think it is tragic. Okay, let's take a look at the Hemingway family. Okay. And by this, I mean, here's Ernest. He's six years old. Over there is his sister, Marceline. She's 14 months older than he. His father was a doctor, Dr. Ed Hemingway. His mother, more about her, Grace Hall Hemingway, a uh, big personality, um, and the children are Sonny, or Madeline, and Ursula. Two more children will come along many years later, his youngest sister Carol and his youngest brother Lester. So six children, big family. Hemingway's father really taught Hemingway how to be at home in the outdoors. He loved it, both of them, and he passed that on to his son. His father very carefully taught him the right way, and I was looking at Kasky's recipes, and I thought, of course, they're this, this detailed, 
because Hemingway really believed there was a right way to do something and you should master it. So how to clean a horse, you know, how to dress a deer, all of these kinds of things. So um, this he gets from his father and um, his mother and Hemingway, starting when Hemingway's pretty young, butt heads. And his younger sister, Carol, said, you know, of all the six of us, he's the one who's the most like her. She was very dramatic. Uh, she came from a well-to-do family. She taught music lessons. She started out as an opera singer. Um, she very much supplemented the family's income. She radiated this kind of warmth. Um, and just as Hemingway did, drew people to her. Uh, she didn't do household chores. She didn't cook. His father did. And because her mother said, if you train a woman to work in the kitchen, that's always where she'll end up. So Grace did not do that sort of thing. Uh, Hemingway's father organized the kids to do the laundry. And evidently he was, you know, he was cool with all that. But she was very much devoted to the arts. And um, yeah, they, they did indeed butt heads. Now you may have heard a little bit about the topic of gender fluidity in Hemingway because in the 1990s, his manuscript, The Garden of Eden, which is about a young husband and wife and how they do a kind of sexual role-playing game where the wife cuts her hair short and takes on the husband's name, the husband takes on the wife's name, how that's very tension-filled in a pleasurable way. Um, and a lot of Hemingway scholars have traced it, this back at least partially to something that Grace did, his mother. Here's a picture of Ernest, young Ernest as a boy. Do you notice anything unusual about this dress? Like what? He's dressed as a girl. It was, it was common, but, here's the but. Yes, very often they dress little boys as girls, um, except Grace did this uh, with Marceline and Ernest, uh, and with Ernest, until he was five years old, dressed him in girls' clothes, which he had begun to chafe against. Um, she, Grace, very much tried to make them into twins. Um, her oldest daughter, Marceline, who went into the first grade, Grace had her held back for a year. So she and Ernest would always be in the same grade together. And, you know, their first high school prom, Ernest had to take his sister, Marceline. So Ernest, and it's really with his fourth wife, Mary, that he begins to open up in his letters about how enticing he finds this kind of thinking and this role playing. Um, and in his manuscript that was posthumously published, The Garden of Eden, the book is centered around what happens in that gender fluidity. But I just wanted to put that there because Hemingway is so associated with, you know, there's a man is a man and a woman's a woman and never the, well, not never the twain shall meet but they're very, very different from each other. Okay, let me go to the next theory. Hemingway worked on his high school newspaper, but, and his family was very, you know, they were financially well off, and his father had gone to Oberlin, and his father wanted Hemingway to go to Oberlin. And Hemingway said no and he went to work for the Kansas City Star as a reporter. He was there for about seven months, and in a letter he writes to his father, and he says, this is my college. You know, this is where I'm learning how to write, to be absolutely accurate, to write quickly, to write well, to be precise. And Hemingway developed what he called his iceberg theory of writing. It was really his first wife, Hadley Richardson, who came up with this notion of the iceberg. She said, I think your writing is so marvelous, it reminds me of an iceberg because so much is left unsaid. And that is true. I mean, he 
absolutely pioneered this way of writing. And when he was at the Kansas City Star, of course, there was a style sheet that reporters used. So look at the things from the style sheet that he kept all his writing life. You know, use short sentences, use short first paragraphs, use vigorous English, avoid adjectives, and I wanted to show you a quotation um, from, I mean, I love his short stories more. I, there's some novels that I really love, but the short stories I think are just amazing and sublime. He's a master of that genre. Let's take a look at uh, a quote from The Big Two-Hearted River to really see this iceberg style in place. Okay. In the big two-hearted river, and this is, er, you know, he's only 26 when he's writing this. Uh, Sun Also Rises has not come out yet. Uh, the main character, Nick Adams, is a young man who's returned from World War I. And clearly, even though the term PS, PTSD was not coined by then, Nick is suffering the repercussions from that war. And he's trying, and here he's in northern Michigan by himself, hiking and going to build a camp and going fishing. Uh, and the war is not mentioned. But how does Hemingway get that across in his writing? He, Nick Adams, walked along the road, feeling the ache from the pull of the heavy pack. The road climbed steadily. It was hard work walking uphill. His muscles ached and the day was hot, but Nick felt happy. He felt he had left everything behind, the need for thinking, the need to write, other, other needs. It was all back of him. How does this quotation work to hint that there is a lot more going on here, a lot more of the iceberg than what you can see. And I'm just opening up for people to answer for discussion. So we've got this repeat of age and age being in there, which is not just mental age. Right. That is very, uh, that's a really good point, the ache and the ache. That, that's not just physical muscles aching, but perhaps he has another wound as well. And as, you know, as the story develops, you'll find it, indeed that's true. What else? Oh boy, there's a lot illuminated, suggested in other needs. What are those other needs? And if you're Ernest Hemingway, you don't say. You don't say. You hint at them, but you don't go into psychoanalyzing things. Anything, anything else that gives you the sense? Yep. Yes. Absolutely. What was his background? It was all back of him, and he felt happy. You know, that's a short decorative phrase, easy to read, but why does he feel happy? It sounds like it's unusual for him to feel happy. And, you know, what is the relationship between Nick and nature and whatever his past is that makes him feel happy in this moment? But you see, and I mean, you read Hemingway and you love him, you see this very pared down style that he first learned at the Kansas City Star and really worked and worked on perfecting that, um, you know, his whole life. So I want to go on. The other thing that's happening here. Yes, yes, sorry, thank you. No, 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 please do. We have, it was all back of him, but the back capitalized on his back and his head. Good. So the that's great. No, it was all back of him. Yeah, the heavy backpack is yeah. It's making his muscles ache. But is the pack is metaphorical? That's I think that's a terrific reading of this. And so there's a tension here between, of course, the happy image superficially that we're being given here, and something really weighing him down, tugging him down, and what will that be? So let's, let's move on. 
I wanted to show you. This is what Hemingway said about a literary icon who really mattered to him, Mark Twain. And he wrote, he said, all modern literature comes from one book by Mark Twain called Huckleberry Finn. American writing comes from that. There was nothing before. There has been nothing as good since. What do you think he means by that? And how might you see Twain, what do you, how might you see Twain influencing him in some ways? And believe me, this is a question I'm trying to answer. The only thing I've been able to come up with is they were both recorders before they became imaginative writers. You know, they were both men who really wanted to write about the real world, and neither of them had an ounce of sentimentality in them. There was no sentimentalism in Twain. And so I think Hemingway really enjoyed that. But just to give a little credit where credit is due, let me go on. All right. After working for seven months at the Kansas City Star as a cub reporter and covering things like murders, gangsters, what was happening in the morgue, I mean, it was a very lurid kind of work that he was doing, and he loved it. But after seven months, like a lot of young men in his generation, he really wanted to go and fight World War I. And unfortunately, he had a vision problem in his left eye, as his mother did. So the Army, you know, wouldn't take him. They said, no, you know, you don't pass. We're not going to let you become an Army uh, soldier. And so he joined up the Ameri with the American Red Cross to become an ambulance driver in Italy. I mean, right, and they put him right on the front lines. Look at him. I mean, how would you describe how he looks? Drop dead gorgeous, stone cold beauty, yeah. I mean, he is just one of the handsomest men, you know, I've ever laid eyes on. And so he has this just, you know, just this, these looks that draw people to him. Also, he has this very enthusiastic personality. He gets involved with this and that and the other, and he loves to bring his friends into it. Lots of charisma, lots of warmth. But this is what he looks like as he's going off to war. And his looks are pretty amazing, I think, through most of his life. He's just very attractive. So here he's 17 and goes over. Oh, and I'm, yeah, let me skip to the other thing. Mark Twain and the other, for me to skip back to this, Hemingway as a prose stylist. Hemingway was deliberately experimenting with how English fiction was written, liter fiction in English was written. And he was part of the larger movement known as modernism. Modernism as a literary and philosophical movement really started around the late 19th century in English, in America. And modernism means that you experiment with form. And you look at these paintings by George Brock and by Picasso, and Hemingway and Picasso were friends. And you see what is happening here. I mean, can somebody just give me your impression of one or both of these paintings? And you can imagine that early modernist authors did not receive a warm reception. What are these paintings not like? Let's start there. What's missing? Yeah. They're not representational. I mean, they're not like a, you know, really nice snapshot of the world, right? Here, you know, things are broken up into different angles. This newspaper spreads out. This easel is there. Um, there's tension between these elements. But it really, this thing is saying, and modernism really emphasized this again and again. You know, I am a work of art. I am not the real thing. 
uh, you know, in a representational portrait where the details are perfectly captured, the modernists got tired and said, that really obscures the function of art. And so they flouted it, both in visual artistry and in music and in writing, and Hemingway was a modernist writer. I mean, the experimenting that he was doing, the cutting away and cutting away and cutting away, he is pushing forward the form of American prose. Um, yes, and he was very good friends with Pablo Picasso. So you see that Hemingway, when he is in Paris and he's surrounded by this expatriate group, Gertrude Stein, John Dos Passos, um, Picasso, Ezra Pound, James Joyce, he's just in this rich mix of modernist ideas that are happening all around him. And it became a great place for him to be. Let's see. Oh, and yes, Joy, that Juan Gris painting on the inside of Death in the Afternoon, yeah, it's just, it's lovely, of the bullfighter in the modernist style. I thought that was so wonderful to see. In terms of his literary influences when he was in Paris, one that many people don't hear much about is how much Gertrude Stein meant to him as a mentor. Now, Stein is really an experimental writer. If you have read her writing, she doesn't like to use any punctuation. She doesn't capitalize things. You know, it, she uses repetition a lot. I mean, she's tough. It's tough to read her writing, and it's kind of an acquired taste, because at first you're like, this is not even any kind of a story. And if you stick with it, you know, things do get better. But she really took him under her wing and worked and worked with him on his manuscripts, especially the manuscript of The Sun Also Rises. And even more than he had pared it down, she pared it down more and more and more and more. So the Hemingway style actually comes, at least part of it, from his interaction with other people like Gertrude Stein, um, Sherwood Anderson, was his very good friend. And Sherwood Anderson also worked with the manuscript to make it tighter, to get rid of things that seemed like padding or something that was loose. Here, you get a taste of what Hemingway's life was like in Paris. Um, by this time, Hemingway is married to his first wife, Hadley Richardson. They're living in Paris, largely because it's cheap, but also because as an artist and a writer, this was simply where you wanted to be. And here is Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Toklas's living room, where you have, I mean, and these are modern, modernist masterpieces. These things are all in museums today, hanging from the ceiling to the floor, just surrounded by this rich kind of art. And Hemingway just flourished in this environment. Let's see. This, this one? I'm not sure, but I think it is that Hemingway that I see who is one of the writers who is one of the most Oh, wow. He, he, did, he also did Gertrude and his daughter. And yes. I think Picasso and I think Hemingway. Exactly. He said that he wanted to write like cubist artists. And so I know that's a quote that I'm familiar with. I didn't know about the Cezanne. Thank you. But of course, I mean, he's pulling all of this in and saying, you know, well, what kind of artist can I be? So he's very affected by these things. Um, like many, his generation after World War I, Gertrude Stein said, you are all a lost generation, which is kind of famous saying, the sense that World War I, and if you think about Frederick Henry's speech in A Farewell to Arms, where he says, you know, words like glory and patriotism were empty now, you know, that they had been used to trick us, basically, into seducing to serve the state. And 
So very young, that generation is learning to be suspicious of institutions that just a little while ago commanded loyalty and respect automatically. Suspicious, suspicions about the government, suspicions about the military, suspicions about political rhetoric. And Frederick Henry and Her Hemingway come out of World War I very, very skeptical about this kind of overblown language of jingoism and militarism. This is something that Hemingway writes, in addition to Frederick Henry's speech in A Farewell to Arms, in his own essay. And he published dozens of these essays. And he's so prolific, it's incredible. But this is a very good one, Notes on the Next War. And Hemingway wrote, they wrote in the old days that it was sweet and fitting to die for one's country. But in modern war, there is nothing sweet nor fitting in your dying. You will die like a dog for no good reason. So the so-called lost generation have a pretty cynical take on that language of patriotism, but also ideas about what they saw, very narrow ideas about nationalism, about imperialism. Hemingway is involved in that. Did he love America? Yes, he did, deeply. Did he love everything that America always and ever did? No, he didn't. And so this is something that he's writing for, you know, the ones who've come through World War I and the younger generation who very soon are going to be going into World War II. Okay, this is the first novel that put him on the map in 1926. He had, as you've heard, written a, a parody, a satire of a novel, The Torrents of Spring. It's terrible. And it was because he owed his publishers one more novel to get out of the contract. He wanted to be with another publisher. And it's also very mean-spirited, The Torrents of Spring. Sherwood Anderson had been nothing but good to Ernest Hemingway in Paris. He introduced him to people, gave him letters of introduction to other people. And this, The Torrents of Spring, mocks the book that Anderson had just written. And there's a very squeamish letter from Hemingway to Anderson, whom he knew well, saying, oh, I felt like I had to point out that you were writing badly, that as, as an author, it was my duty to write this book and to show everyone, you know, that you really had gone off the track. And it's like, no, this is mean-spirited. You know, this is vicious. This is biting the hand that feeds you. And Hemingway would do that again and again in his life. There would be someone who materially helped him, and he would turn around and skewer them. And uh, his friend F. Scott Fitzgerald is a notable representation of that. Um, Fitzgerald and Sherwood Anderson were essential in getting this novel published. Fitzgerald took it to Max Perkins his editor in New York and said, you've got to read this, you've got to publish it, it's really amazing. Um, same thing, Anderson was just very, very influential. Um, but it's fascinating to me that in the first really powerful novel that Hemingway publishes, the hero, the protagonist, Jake Barnes, he's been castrated. No, he hasn't. He hasn't? No. What is it, what is it? Mutilated. Castrated. Okay. In other words, he kept his cojones. Yes. But he lost the equipment for delivering his masculinity. Okay, got got that. that that's okay. why he, Barnes looks in the mirror and goes, what a funny place to be breathing. You know? So there, it's that, not that he's... Someone once compared Barnes to the Sears in Pamplona. Mm -hmm. And then they went ballistic. Oh. He said, he said, he is not castrated. I didn't. But he still maintains his masculinity. I stand corrected. Thank you for pointing that out. Why he is impotent, he is impotent because that there's a lot yeah, of sexual yeah. Really yeah. Between 
Jake and Lady Brett, there's a, you know, you think, oh, they are so suited to each other. The urge is there, but the ability is not. Okay, yeah, yeah. I wonder why he did that. And I, I'm not, I don't know, hiding the secret answer. In his first novel about World War I, why he has Barnes wounded in his manly parts. Go ahead, Caskey. So, uh, Okay. Okay. So this was a. Right. 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 And he can't. He can't do anything. Right. I mean, what a legacy for war to leave a man with. You know, if you want to point out the kind of the hideous legacy of war. That's certainly one way to do it. And, I mean, I have kind of a love-hate relationship with Hemingway. I really love the way he writes as a prose stylist. I really have a problem with his women characters because Hemingway's women tend to be one of two types. The bitch goddess, and Lady Britt Ashley is the first one that turns up in his first novel, and she is emasculating. I mean, she is cold, and she's heartless, and she is not warm and tender in any way at all. Um, in the relationship she has, because it's, she's attracted to Jake Barnes, she seems to carry some of the masculinity there. But Hemingway's women typically fell into one of two camps. They were bitch goddesses, or they were angels. So if you look at Pilar in For Whom the Bell Tolls, if you look at Catherine Barclay in A Farewell to Arms, these are women who are pliable, who never get angry at their man, who will do whatever he wants. They're sweet, they're kind, and at one point, um, well Hemingway began to get criticism on this for like, really? Let me go to the next, next slide. Here. This is Agnes von Kurowski. She was the Red Cross nurse that Hemingway fell madly in love with when he was hospitalized in Italy as an ambulance driver, and he'd been there only a week. He was taking chocolates and cigarettes to the men at the front lines. A mortar went off very near him. It killed one Italian man, it badly wounded another, and it put 237 pieces of shrapnel in Hemingway's legs and torso. And Hemingway he did not remember doing this, but the wounded man he picked up and carried to safety before he collapsed. And for that, he got this silver, silver medal of valor from the Italians. I mean, it sounds amazing. Um, and over the years, as Hemingway would retell the story, he'd be carrying the man like 300 yards. You know, I mean, that, that would get bigger and bigger. But he did do this very heroic thing. And then he's in the hospital for quite a long time in a good bit of pain. And Agnes is about... I think she's nine years older than he, but he just falls for her completely. And they begin an affair. Um, in the letters back and forth between them, you, you can tell that he is smitten. And she will call him like little pet nicknames, but she doesn't respond with that kind of ardor, you know. I mean, she's like, you're a kid, you know. Um, but this goes on for many, many months. Hemingway thinks he's going to marry Agnes. It's that serious. Um, and the Ka Catherine Barclay, the character in A Farewell to Arms, is absolutely modeled on Agnes. That's where that, that portrait comes from. Um, this is a famous quotation from Hemingway's writing. If people bring so much courage to this world, the world has to kill them or to break them. So, of course, it kills them. And this is what Frederick Henry says after 
Catherine dies in childbirth, giving birth to their, their first baby. Um, and then he walks in the rain back to the hotel. Now, he, Hemingway's writing that conclusion here in Sheridan, and he said he probably rewrote it 17 times that he was a meticulous craftsman. And so, and it is, you know, just such a punch in the gut in a good way when you get to that point. Now, Scott Fitzgerald got on Hemingway a little bit for this portrait of, Karen, of Catherine because Catherine really is sweet and loving and good and nurturing and kind and all of the above. She's angelic. So his friend Scott Fitzgerald you know, wrote to him that, and Scott said, in the short stories, Cat in the Rain and Hills Like White Elephants, Fitzgerald wrote, you were really listening to women. Here, you're only listening to yourself, to your own mind. And Hemingway put, made a little annotation in the margin of the letter and said, kiss my ass, Ernest Hemingway. Now, Hemingway had trouble taking criticism from most people. He was very competitive. And Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby comes out in 1925. The Sun Also Rises comes out in 1926. And so he was, indeed, he was in that group of young writers. Uh, and he and Scott have a very troubled friendship, characterized mostly by Hemingway bullying him. Scott seemed to worship Hemingway. And Hemingway would often dismiss him and tell stories about Scott's small manly parts, to try to put that as delicately as I can. Um, Scott's wife, Zelda, did not like Hemingway. They hated each other on first sight. And what Zelda said is, nobody is that manly. She saw it as a performance. And Virginia Woolf said much the same thing, you know, that Hemingway has a kind of self-conscious masculinity, that he feels like he needs to be on stage performing this, you know, macho character again and again and again. Um, and as his life goes on, his fans and demand that, and his celebrity also pushes him to keep living up to this male ideal. So let's go. Hemingway is a sportsman in the Hemingway Code. Caskey talked about this, you know, much better than I can. Um, but this was essential to both Hemingway's enjoyment. He really loved to fish and to hunt, to deep sea fish, all of this. And there are so many pictures of him. You know, here he is with a, I think that's a sailfish. Marlin. Marlin. I was going to say marlin or sailfish. Thank you, marlin. Um, he's in Key West. You know, uh, he just looks, he's grinning. I mean, he's defeated this enormous fish, right. And here he's on an African safari. He's killed a lion. So these things get picked up in the press, you know, again and again and again. Um, and Hemingway did indeed have kind of an unspoken but a very clear code by which he lived and by which his heroes lived. And it included behaviors like this. A man must be physically brave. He must be unafraid of risk. And mentioned this a little bit before, a man must know precisely the right way to do a task, whether it's bringing in a trout from a river, fighting a bull, shooting a lion, landing huge sailfish or marlin from deep sea fishing, that there's a right way to go about these things. And Real men know the best way, the right way. There's honor in knowing those kinds of details. A real man, of course, is stoic. You know, you will not find a writer less sentimental, I believe, than Ernest Hemingway. He really sticks to that code of silence. But with the iceberg, you know there's so much pain buried. There's so much, you know, of a dilemma, a trauma that's it below the surface in that story, and the story is written to alert you to that. There will be 
clues about that. You have to read Hemingway very closely, sure. but he's not going to go, you know, into five pages of psychoanalysis ever. Um, a man should have a personal sense of honor that he never violates, whether he is in an emergency situation, whether he's in war, no matter what kind of stresses he's under. He doesn't, he's not cowardly, for one thing. He doesn't take the easy way out. And Hemingway very much believed that a man should be a man's man. You know, there's, at least in most of his writing, there's a sharp divide between men and women, mostly. Where, you know, men go out with other men and they do a lot of drinking and they have a great camaraderie. By the time Hemingway had moved to Key West, with his um, second wife, Pauline Pfeiffer, because her uncle had bought the Key West place for them, he started to develop an entourage. He just males that loved to be around him. And this, uh, I'll talk about this in just a moment, but in this biography, a point, and this is a great biography, a point that Mary Dearborn makes is that as he grew older, this, he would have this group and that in a lot of ways they were really enablers. They would never criticize him. You know, they would never say, oh, this is really, your writing's getting really flabby here. That thing that you said was just vicious and cutting. No, he was, and that's when this started. But he loved this. One of the times, I'll talk about his traumatic brain injuries in just a second, uh, but one of the times that he one of the many times, uh, that he gave himself a concussion. He was with all these guys out on Pilar, the boat. And his third wife was Martha Gellhorn. She was a war correspondent. And Martha Gellhorn said, you know, Hemingway said, I'm out patrolling for Nazi submarines. And Gellhorn said, he's out there getting drunk with his buddies. You know, there's all kinds of weapons on the boat and everything. And so, on one of these occasions, Hemingway is fishing and he lands a great big shark. So um, he pulls this thing in and it's thrashing and thrashing and thrashing. And Hemingway says, you know, well, this is how you take care of that. And he pulls out a pistol and he's going to shoot the shark twice. Bam, bam. Do you know what he does? Shoots himself in the legs. You know, that's where the bullets go. He's so drunk, he shoots himself in his legs. Um, and another concussion happens on the boat. He slips and smashes his head. So this is a wild, rough, very manly kind of life that Hemingway is living. And it certainly reinforces his image as this super masculine writer. And as time goes on, it starts to take a toll. So let's go to that. Mm -mm. Oh, you know this. Yes, I wanted to focus on this since we're in Sheridan. The Wine of Wyoming. Or it's actually, I think, Wine of Wyoming. I don't think the is in it. Um, a lot, when this story appeared, it's after sh he had spent a good bit of time in Sheridan. And he wrote to Max Perkins and he said, I want to write a different kind of story. This is not a story about bullfighting, it's not about killers, it's not about violence. Uh, the unnamed narrator is here in Sheridan, and he is at a, they're Swiss? Because they speak French. Whatever, whatever, yeah, yeah, I mean, this couple, Madame Fontaine and her husband, have moved to America, and it's prohibition, and they make beer and wine really good homemade beer and wine. And as the story opens, the narrator is sitting and it's on the sunny patio. It's beautiful. He can look out across the plains. He can see the mountains. I mean, it's about as far from the world of a clean, well-lighted place that you can get in that opening. But as the story goes on, you realize, and there's you know, certainly the story lets you know that this is located on a dry, dusty plain. The narrator can see the mountains, but they're far away. And if you know Hemingway, you, as a Hemingway character, you don't want to be on a dry, dusty plain. Bad things happen there. 
you know, the mountains, that's where there's some real refuge and sanctuary. So he, the narrator, speaks some French, and they converse, and one of the things they talk about in the, the short, story sto short, short story shows are these Americans who come up, right? very coarse, these guys, they're already drunk, and they're saying, you know, give me some beer, give me some wine. And Madame Fontaine says, oh, no, 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 we're all out. She gave Hemingway, uh, I mean, she gives the narrator the beer, but Hemingway and the narrator are really close. Um, and uh, there's a whole discussion about America in the story. The two presidential candidates are Alfred Smith and Herbert Hoover. So the narrator and the Fontans are very interested in Alfred Smith, the Democrat, being elected. And one of the things that the narrator says, and it turns out to be true, is Americans won't vote for a Catholic. There's so much discrimination against Catholicism and against, that way, against the Fontans as well. And as time goes on, um, Hemingway hears Madame Fontaine talking about their sons, who are teenagers evidently, and some of the trouble they're getting into. It's not huge, they're not killing anyone, but it's just like they're sliding into kind of a life of juvenile crime and dishonesty. By the end of the story, uh, the narrator says, you know, I really do want to taste this wine that you've made. And it's, they've got it in a little bit of an inaccessible place. But uh, the husband of Madame Fontaine says, come back and I will save you this wine. Well, the narrator can't make it back that night. And by the time, of course, he gets there, the husband has already drunk up the three bottles of wine. It's gone. And the narrator feels, you know, this sense of real disappointment. And at the end, they're saying these social niceties to each other. I know you know this far better than I. And Hemingway, the, Hemingway, the narrator says, I'm going to, you know, come back and see you. And the husband is embarrassed. I'm so sorry. You have to come back. We have this wine. And you know as you're reading the end, he's never coming back, you know. The narrator never gets to taste the wine of Wyoming. And there's such a sense of disappointment in that story. There seems like such a promise at the opening with the sunlight and the beauty of the mountains. And then things just really, really do deteriorate and decay. And yes, does any, did anyone know the Monsinis, Charles and Alice, who were here or where they're? Did you, you did? What, please tell me something about them. Their descendants. Their descendants are here. Where did they, do you know where this house is that he's writing about? Cool. I don't know. Wow. <laughs> that, is, that is so, that's, I want to see it, I want to see it, I want to see it. Okay, yeah. All right. All right. Skipping on. Hemingway is turning out short stories, novels, magazine articles. Um, and as I mentioned before, and who knows, one scholar that I read said he had five traumatic brain injuries. Another one said nine. He had repeated severe concussions, and he would never follow the doctor's orders. The doctor would say, you need six weeks of bed rest. And he's like, I'm not doing that. You need to cut way back on your drinking or stop. And that he definitely did not do. Um, he just, you know, he was a terrible patient in that way. He wanted to be up and going. And, you know, in 1954, he, he and his wife Mary were involved in two plane crashes in two days when they were going on safari in Africa. And the second plane that crashed, Hemingway could not, he was a big man, and he could not get out the window. And what he did is he, uses, he used his head to butt his way out of that window. So what we know today about CTE, really for me, as I've been reading Hemingway and seeing that now, I'm like, of course, that was a lot 
of what was going on with him. And people just didn't know it back then. Um, he did write in 1952, The Old Man and the Sea, which was very well received. Um, it won the Pulitzer Prize, and then in 1954, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Hemingway was terrified of public speaking, so he was not going to Stockholm to make an acceptance speech, and also his health was broken. And he wrote, you know, this award, he, how aware he was that this award should have gone to Henry James should have gone to Isaac Dennison, should have gone to these other writers that he truly did not feel worthy. Um, moving into the 50s, the drinking just increases and increases, and his behavior becomes erratic and manic. He is spending money like crazy on stuff they don't need. He's sleeping about two hours a night. He's doing this very pressured talking, you know, he's really wound up. Um, and he could not write to his own standards anymore. And that devastated him. He just did not have the ability mentally to pull that together and to write this tight prose. He had a sense of increasing grandiosity. At one point he goes to a circus and convinces the circus master to let him go in amongst the lions. Because he says, you know, animals know that I am the dominant force here. And so, you know, I mean, it's nuts. You know, and then, you know, so I don't know who it is, but pulls him out of there and says, what are you doing? And he says, no, they know. They won't attack me. So this gets worse. And like his father, before his father committed suicide, um, Hemingway develops a sense of paranoia. He thinks that people are spying on him. He thinks that the FBI, who do have a file on him from his activities in Cuba, but at one point, Hemingway and Mary are going somewhere and catch him. The lights are on in the bank, the local bank, and he tells her, that's the FBI. They're in there looking at my finances. And he believes all of this. He talks and talks and talks about suicide. Finally, they um, take him to the Mayo Clinic, and the story they give the press is he's getting his high blood pressure treated at the Mayo Clinic. But the drug that treats the high blood pressure, Respirdine, also treats psychosis. Um, also, while he is there, he gets electroconvulsive therapy. He gets electroshock therapy, 15 rounds of it. And as I was reading, I turned up, if if you are severely clinically depressed, very often electroshock therapy will help you. But if the problem is an organic problem in your brain, like with all of those concussions and that compromised tissue and everything, ECT will make it worse. So Hemingway comes back to catch him, and one of the things he tries to do is walk into an airplane pro propeller because he want, he's serious, he wants to kill himself. Um, and then he gets worse again, they take him back to the Mayo Clinic and bring him back again. And finally, on July 2nd, and this is 18 days before his birthday, he gets his shotgun out of the cabinet and, you know, shoots himself up through here. You know, he commits suicide. And most of his friends aren't surprised to hear it, based on the way he's been, you know, been acting and the things he's been saying. And he couldn't live up to that myth anymore. He couldn't be Ernest Hemingway, you know, the celebrity, the legend. And he could not accept how out of control he felt in terms of his life. I don't want to end on that note. Um, Hemingway has been a remarkable influence on later generations of writers, people like Jack Kerouac, like J.D. Salinger, if you've read Catcher in the Rye. Today, I think the writer who most represents Hemingway's style and thinking is Cormac McCarthy, whom I think is wonderful, but very hard and brutal and unsentimental. So Hemingway's still with us. And before I stop, I just want to let you know, this 
biography really influenced what I'm saying. Ernest Hemingway by Mary V. Dearborn. She is the only woman to write a biography of Hemingway. This came out last year, and it's gotten rave reviews, justifiably so. So this is the book I'd recommend. But thank you very much. Um, the, the Monsinis, M-O-N-C-I-N-I, the Monsinis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Question about Ernest Hemingway's relationship with his with his children. Yes. Oh. Uh, yes. And did it really fall apart during these last years? Yes, it did. He, you know, he had one son, um, John, with Hadley, his first wife, and with Pauline Pfeiffer, who, you know, was as different as Hadley as someone could be. Pauline was very sophisticated, you know. He had two sons, Patrick and Gregory. But on the one hand, if the boys needed money, he would send that. And then on the other, he would really pick at them in the letters. You know, when are you going to make something of yourself? You know, you're just wasting your life away. You're a nobody. You're a nothing. So it was hard. It, he was a hard father to have. And by the end, while certainly the sons loved him, they weren't especially close to him. Yeah. Gregory, when, when his mother died, Hemingway blamed Gregory. Yes. Gregory uh, became a transvestite. He was a cross-dresser. Transvestite. Did, he did he have the surgery? Yeah. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. That slipped my mind. But um, that idea that Ernest Hemingway's son is a transsexual, you know, is just sort of shocking to so many people. But when Hemingway, at 10 years old, Gregory was in the lingerie drawer of, I think it was Mary Hemingway, and he's rubbing the soft lingerie on his face, and Hemingway catches him at it. And all he says to his son, whom they nicknamed Giggy, he said, we come from a strange tribe, Giggy. You know, no punishment other than that. Okay, we're done. Thank you. Mm -hmm.